I'd like to start with a prayer, so could we just do that first? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the meal that we all just had and the chance to be around brothers and such a nice location. Father, I just pray that as I give the words that I believe you gave me to speak, that they're received in the manner that, that you would and that we all learn uh, from what you have for us. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. All right, so this is my first time here, and it's my, I just got here about an hour ago, and I don't really know the audience that well. I, I asked... Uh, Jody, do most of these guys keep Torah? And he's like, yeah, most of them do. I'm like, okay, that, that's a starting point. Uh, how many people here ever served in the military or law enforcement? Okay, hands down. Good. That's, that's a good number. And just, again, you'll kind of figure out where I'm coming from. All right. I'm going to start with some scripture. You all can turn there. Genesis 1, 27. Genesis 1, verse 27. Somebody want to read that? And Elohim created the man in his image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So, wow, society today, right? He created men, he created women. He created males, he created females. He created them as a uh, different entity and men and women I don't think I'm, I'm giving anybody here any big news are different right we have different characteristics uh, that we are created with and therefore because we have different characteristics we're supposed to have different roles different mission statements that that we are given when I was asked to present today um, I was told that the overall theme was relationships and that the sub-theme was getting young men to step up and assume leadership roles. How many here are under 30? There's the young men. <laughs> All right. All right, so everything I put out, filter it through your own. Uh, don't get offended. If it, if it hurts, it probably hurts for a reason. And if it doesn't hurt, then okay, maybe you can pass it on to somebody else. You know, or if it, you'll figure it out as we go. But I figured I would talk about the roles uh, for men. Be a man. I am PJ, and I am a fully self-actualized male. Now, I first used that verse, that, that phrase, I'm a fully self-actualized male, like 20 years ago. And I want to tell you a story about that, and, and then we'll go somewhere with it. I was working in uh, cubicle land, where, you know, I'd go in and put in my eight hours a day. I had three computer screens and worked with all those people. Many people here know what that's like. And I was the early guy. I would come in at 6.30, I'd work 6.30 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon. And they didn't like that because I didn't take my 30 minute lunch break. And I told them I'm taking my lunch break at 2.30. But I just really wanted to get out of there. This place where I worked, the real early people showed up about eight. Some people didn't stroll in till nine. And so I didn't have to deal with people because believe it or not, the fact I'm standing up here in front of you all, I'm an introvert. Right? And being around a lot of people kind of freaks me out a little bit. But I, I can deal with it. Why? Because I'm a man. <laughs> it's the theme of this talk. But I, I would come in early, and this other guy would come in about 6.30. I usually got in about 6.10 in, in the morning. I started at 6.30. And he'd come in, and we would invariably sit around, because this was a government job, and so I didn't really do a whole lot. I tried to do work in this job. I would go to my boss and say, give me this project. And he'd go, eh, nah, it's okay. And, and so I was not really productive. Not because I didn't want to be. I wasn't making anybody else do work. Nobody in this whole organization did any work, and they hated to hear that. But we would sit around from about 6.30 till about 7.30, drinking coffee and chit-chatting. He was a, what I call, hardcore Christian, as was I at the time. I wasn't a pastor yet. And invariably, we didn't have a Bible study. We weren't sitting down to say, let's talk about the Bible and God. 
it's just like, hey man, what are you doing? What are you doing this weekend? Da, 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 da. It would invariably turn to the word. And it would invariably, Bibles would come out because who doesn't have a Bible at work? And we would sit there and have a mini impromptu Bible study almost every day. And it was free flowing and I really like that. I don't like contrived Bible studies where today we're all going to look at this. What do you think about that? What do you think of it? Well, he got me to go to this thing. And I tried to look it up before this presentation so I could give you the name of it, and I, I couldn't find it. It was 20 years ago, but it was a thing that was going on all over the country, and it was men getting together for an hour before work. And we would do a Bible study and pray with other men, and it was, I think, 6 o'clock in the morning. All right, so I go to one of those, and I made it through two sessions <laughs> before I quit. And again, this is just me, Joe, hardcore Christian. I wasn't a pastor yet or anything like that. I was the furthest thing from a pastor in my own mind. But I, I could only make it through two. And as I perceived it, and as I understood it to be, you know, my perception of this thing, it was structured along the, uh, the premise that we as men, you know, this is what they're presenting. We as men have these huge pressures upon us to be men. The world depends on us to be men, and we are expected to be strong. But, but inside, we're all broken men. We all have all this baggage. They even had a little thing we'd watch with a video of baggage and, you know, your dad beat you up, your mom didn't like you, you're, you know, you were molested by your uncle. You know, we all have all this stuff that we're bringing to the table and we're just broken men. And guys, on day two, and they, they did this thing where they tried to do this false sense of closeness. Like, I'm close with couple hands fulls of people that I can actually go to and talk to. Now, this is me. This doesn't mean it's everybody, but I'm giving you my perception of what was going on. So they had this false closeness, like you and I are going to suddenly become best friends and share our deepest secrets with each other. I don't even know you. <laughs> but that's what they were doing. And there were men who were crying within two days in this course in the morning. There were men who were weeping. And it didn't strike me. Is like my kind of thing. And so I told my buddy that I was no longer going to attend. And he said, why not? Because he loved it. Because he was one of the guys that was crying at the thing. And I said, well, Doug, we'll call him Doug. <laughs> Doug, I'm not broken. He goes, well, you've had things happen to you in the past. I said, yeah, everybody has. But I'm not broken by it. And I said, and I'm not carrying around a lot of baggage that I can't deal with. And I don't need to show you my baggage. That, that was kind of what I told him. And then that's when I said, I'm a fully self-actualized male. And it made his head kind of go like that. <laughs> and he said that I was covering up for past wrongs and hurts and failures. And I said, no, man, I'm just dealing with them like a man. Amen. That's where we're going today. So for those of you who don't know, and probably most of you do, self-actualization comes out of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if you don't satisfy the base needs, you can't work on the higher needs. And self-actualization is at the top. That is the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs after your psychological, your ego, your physical needs are all taken care of. It means you're an okay, complete person. That your personal... Pro, your personal that word potential is fully realized I had to look it up all right I used the phrase I didn't quite know what it was so here's my intro and why I said that <sighs> I was born to a CIA family both my parents worked for the CIA uh, I lived overseas for the bulk of my childhood mostly in Asia but not exclusively uh, my parents were married through the formative years of my life I was a big brother to a little brother, 
you know, in my mind, this is like 1950s, other than the CIA part, overseas part, normal. Um, I learned to fire submachine guns and pistols when I was five years old. Uh, I was evacuated. We bugged out as a family twice by the time I was seven years old. I was in what I refer to, and I'm probably going to write a book on it someday, whether it's fiction or not, I don't know, the, child, the, the CIA Child Warrior Program when I was 11. Um, I lived a generally, when I became a teenager, monogamous life, meaning I had a girlfriend starting in ninth grade all the way forward. I never cheated on one girlfriend, so I'd have a, like a girlfriend break up with her, get another girlfriend. So in my mind, that, that was kind of normal. I was a lifeguard for six years. I saved three people in that time from drowning. Um, I was married to my last girlfriend 39 years ago. And we had three kids, and they're all fine. They're all educated adults. They were all valedictorian of their high school class. I've got six grandkids right now that are doing fine. I was an airborne ranger Green Beret in the Army, which is what I wanted to do from the time I was about nine years old. Um... I was the Assistant Deputy Director of Intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. I traveled the world and, and I told a boss this one time. He said, I need everybody to give me like one short paragraph about you when he took over in the military. And I didn't really like him and he didn't know how to handle me. So what I told him was, uh, I have dined with ambassadors and warlords, a princess and whores. And that's true. I, I have. <laughs> um, I said dined with them. The meaning shared like a meal at a plastic table somewhere, but um, what else? I pastored Round Prairie Community Church for six years. I pastored Shofar Mountain for over a decade. I have a YouTube channel, a Patreon channel. I wrote a book. I've been in four documentaries. I formed a tribe. I was key in forming a tribe, the Shofarians, and now we're in many camps. Um, I could live almost anywhere but I choose to live an off-grid, neo-pioneer lifestyle. So that's why I say I'm a fully self-actualized male. I've had, a, I've had a pretty cool, interesting life, I think. And have I had setbacks? Yes. Have I had failures? Yes. Have I had bad things happen to me? Yes, I have. Okay. Who here hasn't, right? So big deal. I'm just trying to show you uh, where I was coming from and what, how I approached that early morning class when I saw all these guys saying, oh, woe is me, poor baby, me. And that's basically my problem, my personal problem with the state of men in, I was going to say America, but I guess we have Canadians here. North America. I've known some Canadians. <laughs> it, it, it's my problem with the state of men Today in the West, it, it, Europe went bad a long time ago. Um, and it's not my problem. It really is the problem. Now, the overarching problem, which I could have gone into here, but I thought it would be like, yeah, we know, PJ, is that we've turned from God. We've turned from Almighty Yah. That is the problem. But I'm getting down, you know, we are created as flesh and spiritual beings, right? We have to live in this flesh world. We're expected to perform our roles as men in the flesh world, and that is primarily, but not exclusively, what I'm talking about. There are rarely good men today. I go shopping. I get out in the world every now and then. I see people out there, and I just shake my head. You're going shopping in the middle of the day in freaking pajamas? What the hell's wrong with you? I see guys talk about things in, in non-manly ways, and they're not gay. And it's like, what are you doing? Where, there's a problem with manhood. There's a problem with real men. And I don't usually use language, but man, I couldn't put this next bit any other way. There are too many whiny bitches out there who claim to be men who are not. Amen. Amen. It, it, So that's where I was coming from. That was 20 years ago. It was bad then, and it's worse now. And it's, it's, the trajectory is going up. It is getting just outrageously bad. It's getting to the point, 
I don't watch TV. I haven't had a TV for decades, but now they're putting commercials on my Amazon movies and they're, they're on YouTube when you watch things. You can't watch a commercial where the guy isn't the idiot. Like, what's up with that? There's nothing new under the sun. Let's get into the word, shall we? Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. I'm going to read this one. This is in the garden, right? And I'll just start it out in verse 11. And, and Yah says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? You all know this story, right? Look what Adam says in verse 12. And I'm reading King James, but it's okay. And the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Who's he blaming this on? Starting out blaming Yah. Hey, you gave me that woman, okay? And she's the one that told me to partake of this tree, and so, yeah, I did it. But you gave her to me, and she gave it to He's blaming everybody except himself. He's not taking responsibility for his action. He's not owning it. And that is the problem. It's not a new problem. Men fail to take responsibility. As a man, we are designed to be responsible, to take responsibility. And something I was going to talk about in this chunk of this talk, then I, I didn't write it in my notes, but I'm going to say it now. When you're responsible for something, take responsibility. You don't accept responsibility. That's a pacifistic, feminine word. I accept responsibility. No, you take responsibility. It's your role as a man. And if you have something for which you're not responsible for, but nobody else seems to be responsible for it, what do you do? You take responsibility for it. You seek out responsibility. Don't shy from responsibility as a man. Step up and say, yeah, I'll do it. I, I said, you know, who, who wants to read? Somebody did. That's taking responsibility, right? It's stepping up. In the military, we used to have a phrase, a commander is responsible for everything his unit does and fails to do. So if your unit is assigned to attack that building, it's my unit, and we attack that building, and... Lieutenant J.A. Dudley's platoon just crushes it on his part of it. And then my boss says, hey, Fox, you did a good job taking that building. It's my responsibility. He knows that. He's given me responsibility. But what should I say at that point? Yeah. Lieutenant Dudley is the one who really did a great job on this. You pass the kudos down. You still have the responsibility, but let's flip that on its head. Let's say I failed to take that building, and it was a catastrophe. And the reason I failed is because Lieutenant Dudley fell asleep when he was supposed to be attacking. All right, I'm just picking something ridiculous. The boss says, hey, Fox, you screwed the pooch on that one. What am I supposed to say? Well, the lieutenant that you gave me, he <laughs> fell asleep. No. So say, Roger that, sir. We'll do better next time. You take responsibility. That's the first lesson for today. Take responsibility, especially for your failures. Everybody here has had failures. If you've had a failed marriage, I don't care that she was stepping out on you every Saturday night. It's your failure. You failed to maintain that marriage. If you had an addiction problem, I don't care that your world was all terrible and, and horrible and I just, I, I had to turn to drugs or alcohol or, or whatever. Dude, that's you. That's on you. That's your failure to maintain yourself in a clean state. If you are fat or weak, I don't care. I don't want to hear and nobody should want to hear about I'm 62 and I got a bad knee and it's, I can't even walk right. How am I going to get in shape? Dude, that's your responsibility to be in shape. And we're going to get to that later too. If you're late to work, that's on you. That's, that's nobody else. What time did I say I started work? 6.30. What time did I say I got to work? 6.10. Even when I was late, I was early. You can't have a weak-ass excuse when you're late for work and your boss says, hey, Fox, 
You're 10 minutes late for work. Yeah, my bad. Okay, that's taking responsibility, right? My bad? Zip. But no, nobody does that. My bad, but oh, there was a wreck on 4th Street, man. We were backed up. Dude, what's that? Nah, 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 nah. I'm not listening, right? You clearly didn't leave your house early enough to be able to deal with an adversity that showed up in your path. I don't care. You're late to work. My bad. Won't happen again. Full stop. Does that make sense? You got to own it. When uh, we made mistakes in the military, and it'd be like, you really messed that up. The only really thing we could say is no excuse. Why'd you do that, Fox? No excuse, sir. Now, if they really wanted to know, then they'd get to the bottom of it. But you don't start out saying, well, you know, the woman you gave me. Um, what's the maximum effective range of an excuse? Zero meters. Zero meters. It doesn't matter why you're late, dude. You're late. And because you're late, we couldn't do this thing. So own it. Be responsible. To understand what we are to be responsible for, we got to understand what our roles are as a man. Because we're responsible for those things. Genesis 2, verse 1. Who wants to read Genesis 2, verse 1 through 9? There was no what? There was no man to till the ground. There was no man to till the ground. All right, keep going. Where did he put the man? There was no man to till the garden. So he creates a man, and then he puts the man in the garden that there was no man to till. Right? It makes sense. One more. Thank you. All right, so there's no man to till the ground. And Almighty Yah creates a man, and he puts him in the garden so that, why? It's implied, but it's not implied. Let's scoop, scoot ahead to uh, verse, I think, 16. Uh, we'll go to 15. Lord God, Elohim, Yahweh, he took uh, the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So he put the man, I mean, it's, it's clear, but that... We're just being double clear. He put the man in the garden to dress it and to keep it. And then he told him you can eat uh, most of the stuff in the garden. You can eat of the garden. So people think, yeah, well, it's a garden that Yah created. It's a beautiful garden. It's lush and it has everything he needs to eat. He's got to tend it. See, I think a lot of people skip over that. This is going to produce great stuff for you to eat as long as you do what I told you to do, which is the reason I created you, is to go in there and tend this garden. So there's a specific thing and there's a metaphorical thing there. We can read, and we're not going to turn there, Second Thessalonians. Um, basically, it says if you don't work, you don't eat, right? If you don't work, you're not going to eat. And so that, that just goes off of this. If Adam had not tended that garden that Yah created, that he put Adam in to tend, if he hadn't tended it, he wouldn't have anything to eat, right? So from this, we can learn some things about our responsibilities as men. The first responsibility we have as men, young men, listen up, provide. We are to be the provider if you're tending the garden and it's getting fruit and it's getting food, then you're providing food, right? And that, that's like the overarching 
reason. A man is to provide for his household full stop. We're going to have a question and answer period after this. I'll field anything you want, to, you want to ask about this. I've done it in my own circles. Genesis 2.18. Let's go there. Let's look at that. Genesis 2, verse 18. And Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him, now in King James it says, a help meet for him. How many people have ever heard a man call his wife, my helpmeet? That's a misuse of the, of the language. There's no such thing as a helpmeet. The word meet means suitable. I will make him a help suitable for him. I will make him a helper suitable for him. What's it say in scriptures? I bet you it doesn't say help me. What's it say? Helper, helper as a counterpart for him. So I'm going to make him a helper suitable for him. I'm going to make him a help, a counterpart to him. He still is responsible. When you have a helper, when you're a carpenter and you show up to put in my staircase and I'm paying you $40,000 to do that and you bring along a helper, who's responsible for that staircase? Carpenter. The carpenter, right? I'm paying him to do it. So we have a man to tend the garden. He's responsible for it. He has a helper. He's still responsible for providing. It's just this woman is given to him to help. Man's duty is to provide. Now, I am fully aware of Ecclesiastes 12, 13. You all know that one? It's a pretty cool verse. I'm going to read it off my notes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. To fear Elohim and to keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Okay, so wait a minute, PJ. You're telling me you've got this duty to provide, but 12.13 says, fear Elohim, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. It's the same thing when Yeshua said, you know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. It's just a summation. Adam was commanded to tend the garden. He's keeping the commandments of God. Do you understand that? So then other things fall out of that. One of those is to provide. Another lesson from the garden. One that's near and dear to my heart. Self-reliant. A man is to be self-reliant. I'm going to get to that. Everything comes from Yah, right? There's this phrase. In Chinese, one of my uh, soldiers when I was in special forces spoke excellent Chinese, and it's worship bao shong fai, and it's standing on a mountaintop, mouth agape, waiting on a roast duck. Now that actually is a Chinese proverb parable. I have no idea how you say it in Chinese. I just made that part up, but <laughs> but it, it's to show the futility. You can go out there in that parking lot. And say, Father, if you really love me, you're going to rain $40 billion down upon my head. You know, dude, it's not going to happen, right? You've got to get out there and work for it. He who does not work uh, shall not eat. We are expected to work, and we are expected to be self-reliant. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 6, I think we're in 6. Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. Somebody please read that for me. Thank you. Everybody look at verse 8. Who provides the food in the summertime? Who? The ant. Who's harvesting the food? Who's gathering it at the harvest? The ant. The ant is doing the work. We're told to consider the ant. We're told to look at the ant. We're told to look at her ways and, and be wise. 
You have to work. Yah provides, but the ant has to do the work, and we have to do the work. This is a lesson from the garden. Um, we're supposed to be self-reliant. We're supposed to do the work to make the provisions. It's all through the word. Who built the ark? Sometimes I mess that up and I say Jonah, Jonah's ark. No, it's Noah. Noah built the ark. Now think about it. All powerful, mighty Yah could have contacted Noah and said, Noah, dude, check it out. I'm going to flood the world because I've had it up to here with the evil, but you're okay. You're secure in your generations, and here's what I'm going to do. A big old tree is going to come by. I need you to get on it. You and your people, and oh, a bunch of animals are going to jump on it too. Could he have done that? The father most certainly could have done that. But he said, no, Noah, I know there's no such thing as rivers or lakes. You don't even know what I'm talking about right now. But I want you to build this boat thing. It's going to be really big. And it's going to take you a while. I want you to build that. Noah had to build the ark. Noah had to do the work. Noah had to be self-reliant. Story of the wheat, Joseph, Pharaoh. Who stored the wheat? Joseph. I mean... You know, he, he was over, overseeing of it. Yah could have rained down manna. He could have. He could have just rained down manna on the people, but instead he had Joseph do the work to store the wheat. And we know how that ends up. One of my favorite little parables Yeshua tells about the ten virgins. The ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. I'm not looking at you guys enough, sorry. <laughs> so they're all waiting on the bridegroom, right? You all know that story? They're waiting on the bridegroom. Just consider that for a fact. Who's the bridegroom? Yeshua. They're waiting on Yeshua in, in this story. They're waiting on him to come back. So if somebody is waiting on Yeshua, they are what we call a believer, right? They're like, oh, he's my Lord and Savior, right? In, in the context of most people in this country who read this, they're Christians, right? So they're Christians waiting on Yeshua to come back. And then the five foolish virgins uh, suddenly go, Whoop! man, we might run out of oil. Hey, you guys over here who have all the oil, you've got oil in your lamps, give us some oil so our lamps don't go out. And then what I like to say when I'm actually preaching on this is that those five wise virgins then did the good Christian thing and they said, okay, yeah, we'll share with you our oil because you're our, brother, you're our sisters. We'll, we'll share with you. Is that what they do? No, they say, no, we're not going to give you any oil unless we run out. Go to those who sell and, and do it. And then they go off to buy oil. There's another metaphor in there, which we're not going to get into today. And when they come back, what's the deal with the wedding feast? Too late. Doors locked. You can't come in. And then what I like to say, it's not in there, but it's in other places. There's a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Oh, let us in. These were believers in Yeshua with other believers in Yeshua they weren't shared with, they went off and they didn't make it because they didn't provide their own oil, which they should have done ahead of time. So we're to be providers. We're to be self-reliant. We also are supposed to have discipline as men. This is an area where I think men, and by that I mean adult males, uh, are failing today in our society greatly. Discipline. Going shopping in your little fluffy slippers and your PJ pants is not discipline. It's laziness. It takes discipline to tend a garden. Who here has grown a garden? Good. So you got to go out there. It's fun in the spring, right? Oh, I'm going to till the garden. Like now, oh, we're going to plant carrots and we're planting some turnips and I'm going to put the pumpkins over there. It's all fun and games in the beginning. Everything is, what's that? A new broom sweeps clean, right? Oh, we'll work hard on this. But once it gets going, once that garden is going, it's work. You got to go out there when it's hot and buggy and pull weeds. Not me, PJ. I use back to Eden method. Okay, whatever. You got to get out there and work. You got to water it. Sometimes it's cold when you go out there. I mean, it requires effort. And how many people here, be honest, I'll raise my hand first, have planted a garden, doing pretty good, and then it just gets away from you? Weeds, bugs, deer, it's just like, ah. Oh. You know why? Because we didn't exercise the discipline 
to get out there on a timely basis and address the things before it got away from us. We didn't make that course correction in the beginning when we saw it and say, nope, we're going to fix that right now. We're going to get on that. We lacked the discipline. And that's why it comes from the garden. How many people have said, next this year, I'm going to do better? I have. I'm saying it now. I told my wife last year I helped plant the garden, and then I totally told her early in the growing season, sweetie, I don't have time to do this. It's yours. Oh, that's so weak. See, I'm giving you this talk today, and I tell people when I'm pointing at you, I'm pointing a couple fingers back at me, and it helps make me stronger because I'm kind of yelling at myself too um, or whatever. Um, have you ever resolved to do something like I'm going to plant a great garden and I'm going to tend it this year or I'm going to get fit this year or, you know, something like that, and then you didn't do it? Anybody ever fail at that? Everybody if you're honest, or worse, and not only did you not get it done, you just outright quit, like me on the garden last year. I mean, I literally quit. I just told my wife, I, I can't do it. But I had resolved to do it earlier. There's the problem. It's, the problem wasn't so much, I'll just use me as an example, that I told my wife, I'm done with the garden this year. I, I don't have time to deal with it. I should have never said, if that was the case, I'm going to do the garden. And if I had said, I'm going to do the garden, what should I have done? The garden. Because I said I was going to. Let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. Be a man of your word. Do what you say you're going to do. Don't do what you say you're not going to do. And that requires discipline. It requires doing something you don't feel like doing. I'd rather sit here and... Look at another YouTube video instead of going out there in the heat and weeding. It's lack of discipline. And we need as men to exercise discipline. If you want to be a man, be disciplined. When one tends a garden, when one keeps a garden, one protects the garden, right? You're protecting it from drought. You're protecting it from insects. You're protecting it from weeds. You're protecting it, in my case, from varmints that get into it. Uh, and you could be protecting it from thieves, from people coming in and stealing the way this world's going. Who knows? Um, but that's your role as a man vis-a-vis -vis the garden to protect it. And so one of the roles of men is to be a protector. Oh, people don't like that. And I could go on a big tangent. This all started in World War II. I can go cover that in the, in the uh, question and, and comments if, if you want at the end. But the, we have an epidemic of men failing their responsibilities as husbands and fathers and walking out on their wives with kids. And therefore, we've got little boys being raised by women who don't know the first thing about being a man. So how in the hell is she going to raise a little boy to be a man? And Come on, y'all were little boys. Little boys pick their nose, they fight, they fart, they get really dirty. It's, it's boy behavior. But when a woman raises a little boy, he can't fight, he can't get dirty, he can't pick his nose. Oh, you're way too energetic. Take some Adderall or whatever they give kids for ADD. What, I don't know, I'm not a druggist. But take this medicine so you're less of a boy. That's what they do. That's the problem, and then boys grow up, and guess what they don't know how to do? My son was an adult and had never been in a fight. How many people here have been in a How many people here, be honest, have never been in a fight? See? You know why you guys haven't been in fights? Because if you, let's say I'm your age, and it was three years ago, five years ago, we're in school, and I say your girlfriend's ugly or, you know, you're stupid or, or whatever, and so we're going to fight. They're going to charge us with assault and battery. They're just little boys. on. Now, people closer to my age, 62, man, I was in so many fights growing up, and I wasn't a bad kid or a wimpy kid. Or, I was just a normal kid. Everybody got in fights. Punch somebody in the nose, you get punched in the nose. Eh, it's settled. Two weeks later, you're best friends. You got in fights. Why? Because men fight. Men, and you learn that as a boy. What I'm worried about, you've got these kids today that go into, 
When I went to school, we had shotguns in our pickup trucks in the parking lot. We carried big buck knives, and I had an old timer because I didn't have enough money for a buck folding hunter, in these leather pouches. The knife's got a three and a half inch blade on it, razor sharp, on our belt to high school. There were, I just told you there were lots of fights in high school. <laughs> Nobody pulled out a knife, let alone went out to the truck and got a gun. That's not how men, young men, you like to think you're a man when you're a boy. That's not how you settle things. It wasn't even a thing. But today, people just go so far and then they slip. And it's crazy. I got off on a tangent, sorry. Um, a man is, is expected to protect not only his garden, but his family, his people, his land. It's all biblical. We just got done reading Joshua at Shofar Mountain. We just finished that up. It's all about the land. It's all about protecting your land. It's a weak, feminine excuse to say, but the law won't let me. It's your du- it doesn't change your duty. It's your duty to protect your stuff. It's a God-given duty. I'm not telling you to break the law. Now, the ability to protect requires some sub-abilities. You need other things to to enhance that. We have the specified task to protect. Well, then we have the implied task after that of maintain the ability to protect. If your job is to protect, well, then you have to have the ability to do that. And that's your job, your responsibility to maintain that. And and the first thing is uh, fitness. J.A., when he was fighting in in MMA, how important was fitness in what you did, brother? Just fitness. I know you know all the different stuff, but just fitness is important to fight. And if you're going to protect, you have to be able to protect. You have to know how to fight. See, we're raising a whole generation of boys today who don't know how to fight. I mean, they don't even know how to make a fist. Eh. True story, special forces. I'll make the story short. My team sergeant went away, went to a classified course, came back, was going to teach us how to fight better than than what we already knew how to do. And so one of the things he had us do twice a week is boxing. And so the first thing he taught us to do was how to stand and how to hold your hands and, and all that and how to jab. And he's got us all lined up, and after he taught us, he's like, all right, everybody, you're going to step, jab, step, jab. And we had a green beret go like this. And we all look at him, and we're like, we thought he was goofing off. You know, just, and we're like, Dave, who became a sergeant major, Dave, what are you doing? I'm hitting Did your dad never teach you how to punch? I was raised by my mom. And so here's this like 20-something-year-old Green Beret that we got to actually teach how to throw a punch. There are certain basics to fighting. You don't have to go get a black belt in BJJ or, or something to learn how to do basic things to protect yourself. But as a man, you should be comfortable with the thought that, yeah, I may get in a fight. Okay, let's go. Inherent in your ability to protect to protect is your ability to use tools and weapons. You should be comfortable as a man using tools and weapons. But I do this all day. I don't care. In the afternoon, then you should go do this or this or this. And if you don't know how, there's no sin in not knowing. Seek out training. Go get trained how to use weapons. Go get trained how to protect. How are you going to protect your family, your people, your land, when it comes down and it actually matters if you don't have a clue? It's not going to magically download into your brain from some app on your iPhone. What was that movie? What's that? Matrix? (laughs) Kung Fu Master. So a man should be fit, a man should know how to fight, and a man should be skilled in the use of weapons. Having these abilities is not going to help you if you are unaware. If you are in your own little world of your, what's that, what does TJ call it, the rec, 
Babylonian rectangle of death. Or if you're in your computer game, and now they're coming out with like these things. Dude, you don't have a clue what's going on around you when you're jacked in like that. You go into an alpha wave state and you're totally unaware. I'm, a Boy Scout troop could take your whole house from you at that time. You shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't be in your own little bubble. We used to say in the military, and it applies today, stay alert, stay alive. You should be noticing what's going on you, around you. When you're in the store, you should be noticing what's going on. You shouldn't wait until the bad guy is right in your face with a gun to, to start reacting. It's a bit late at that point. Now, I could go on. I was going to cover in depth the yeas be yay and your nays be nay, be a man of your word. I'm going to look at Phineas, how Phineas protected the land. If you don't know about Phineas, look him up. He was a hardcore uh, dude. Being bold as a man. See, men aren't designed to be little meek men. Well, yeah, okay, whatever you say. What did Yeshua do in the temple? Yeah. Boom! He flipped tables over. I, I love, I hate how some Christian pastors go into that. He plated a whip. He created a weapon. Oh, it was just a string. It was like a wet noodle that he was saying, go away, stop selling. These guys are making their living selling this stuff at the temple. And if some Yehu comes up to them with soft hands, which Yeshua did not have, and goes, ding, 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 with a little string, you think they're going to go anywhere? No. no. He made a weapon because he's like, all right, there's a couple more people here. I need to create an equalizer. So he makes this whip thing. And then he goes around and goes, get the hell out of here. This is a house of prayer. It's a house of my father. It's not some stupid market. And he is flipping tables over. Do you think the merchants were like, oh, okay. No, they were afraid of him. He had a presence in his personality in his righteous indignation that he was showing these people and they're like whoa we're not going to mess with this guy but he still had that whip if they thought they were going to try something i was going to go into that separating the wicked from society separating them from your camp keeping your camp clean this is all throughout torah don't let that crap in your camp don't let that crap in your life. But it all comes back to the fundamentals. Take responsibility. You can tell the greatness of a man by the size of the circle he draws around himself. In our society today, too many men, so-called, again, adult males, have a circle this big, like as wide as their skinny little shoulders. This is my circle. This is what I'm willing to protect. Maybe. Go away. No, it's the man who draws the circle, not just his family, not just his community, not just his tribe. How far do you want to make that circle go that you assume responsibility for, that you say, I am going to have a part in this? That's the greatness of a man, how big he makes that circle around himself. You can't be selfish. Take responsibility, provide, discipline, and protect. I encourage you all to think deeply about these things, like in the quiet times, and just kind of go through them. How am I on that? And be honest with yourself. Where do I need improvement? I'll tell you, we all need improvement in every single one of those categories. There is nobody here that is the perfect man. And I don't even know everybody, but I guarantee I can find something wrong. You're not perfect. But we should strive to be better. We should strive. We have an example in Yeshua, the perfect man. We should strive to be better. We should strive to be stronger men. And you need to come up with your own personal sheet of pluses and minuses. Sustain the pluses. Where you know you're good at something, good. You know, play to your strengths, if you will. But don't ignore your weaknesses, because that's what's going to get you. You're like, well, I'm, I can bench press 350 pounds eight times, and um, I can fight. I guess I'm thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> But I got this thing over here. That's okay. I'm just going to cover that up with this. No, man, you got to deal with that. We all have to deal with that to, to be better. Strive to be worthy men of Yah. Gang, that is it. I am willing to talk about 
I'm willing to address any question or comment that you have. I may not answer it, but yes, sir. Okay, so here's my theory. This is Joe's theory. Played out in my house. I said that my parents remained married during the formative years of my life. They held the marriage together until the last kid was out of the house, my little brother, and then they divorced. But they were divorced in their head for years before that. And this is what happened. World War II, which my mom was born in 41, so she wasn't, you know. World War II, our men went to war. Large numbers of men. If, if, that's another thing. If you look at the numbers of men that went to war in World War II, it's huge. It's huge. Well, there's still factory jobs, and we're producing a B-17 every 30 minutes, and yada, yada, yada. Who's doing those jobs? Women. women. And they had to, right, for us to do that. Rosie the Riveter, women stepped up. War's over in only like four years. The men all come back. What do those women do? They tasted freedom. They tasted not having to do the drudgery of washing dishes and wiping babies' noses and changing diapers. And I was really somebody, and I was contributing, and I was making money. And they came back to the house, and that's when it started. That's when women's lib, which was a thing in the 70s, women's liberation, you can have it all, baby, came about. And it started to create this tension in our society where for thousands of years, men had a role in the household and women had a role in the household. Look in Afghanistan, look in uh, Asian cultures, look in, it's the way of people. Men have a role because we're physically stronger, we have testosterone, we can fight, we can provide, we can do all that stuff, men have a role. Women have another role. They're complementary helper suitable for you that complements you, right? So. It started breaking that all up until divorces were never a thing in America until like the 60s is when divorce started taking off. And a little side story, I was in an office in cubicle land and I was talking to a, a couple majors. I was a major at the time. And I'm like, yeah, my grandfather got off the boat um, from Germany. And this guy's like, yeah, my grandfather did this and dun 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 dun. And there was one soldier, he was an NCO, there's a rank difference there. He was an E7 Sergeant Sanders. And I just felt like he was being left out of the conversation because it's a bunch of majors talking. And I said, Sergeant Sanders, what's your, and I did quick math because Sergeant Sanders was black. And I did quick math, all right, no way his grandfather was a slave. He's not old enough. I said, so Sergeant Sanders, what did your grandfather do? And he looked at me with disgust. And said, sir, I don't even know who my father was. And I'm like, what? And what he told me was, and this was back in somewhere around 2000, 75% of blacks in America grow up without their father. I didn't believe him. I went, huh, I'm sorry to hear that. I went back to my computer. I got on Google and I looked it up. Guess what? That's true. Well, now that's true for white people. That's true for like everybody except Asians. Maybe Hispanics. I didn't look up Hispanics. White, whites and blacks. 75% of boys are growing up with not their father. That's a huge problem. And then it gets to the women not knowing how to raise boys. It's not their fault. A man knows when he sees his boy fall down and scrape his knee and he's all dirty because he was fighting with the neighbor kid across the street. He's like, get up, rub some dirt in it. You'll be okay. Come on. Good job. Or come here. I need to teach you how to box right? Because I just saw you got your butt kicked by the neighbor. That's how a dad handles it. Mommy's like, oh my God, Billy, Billy, I told you not to fight. I told you not to get dirty. I need you on drugs. And, and that's the problem with our society today. So, and it's, I think it started in World War II. So, yes, sir. You. Is the Torah not what? Reference to the light. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff in the oil. But is, this is what I tell people about parables in the Bible. Most parables have a deeper meaning, right, in the Bible. That does not negate the obvious meaning that they're talking about. It doesn't make that go away, right? And the thing that struck me when I learned that, that parable was these, these are all Christians. I mean... 
Back then I was a Christian when I learned it. These are all Yeshua followers who are waiting, and half of them aren't making it. And then you get to what I call the scariest bit of the scripture, and when Yeshua says, you know, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, Master, Master, in your name we did all these things, you know, we cast out demons, we healed the sick, we raised people from the dead. Um, and I'll say to them, get away from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And when I was an early Christian, I would look at that and I'd be like, okay, that's like bikers and pedophiles and, you know, no offense to any bikers. <laughs> I've learned, but back then I hadn't. And, and so, you know, I was just like, these are bad, creepy people. No, they're not. These are people, Yeshua comes back and they're like, Master, Master, you're home. I've been waiting for you. And then look at all these good things I've been doing in your name. I've been doing this and I've been doing... And what they want, what they're expecting is a pat on the head and saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what they're expecting. Dad, my dad used to go away on a lot of trips, believe me. And when he'd go away, <laughs> two things. My mom had told me eight times while he was gone, you wait till your father gets home. Uh, and so I'm worried about that. And so then like the week before he'd get home, I'd do all these extra chores. So he'd come in the door and I'd say, Dad, I polished your shoes and I did this and I washed the car and I did that. And I'm expecting him to say, okay, that, that wipes out what your mom said. I mean, but you're expecting a pat on the head. And he says, get away from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. What's iniquity? lawlessness. What's lawless? What's Yeshua talking about when he says lawlessness? He's not talking about Roman law. He's not talking about U.S. code. He's talking about Torah. You didn't keep Torah. If you love me, keep my commandments. They weren't doing that. And these are people who are, I'll come to you, who are expecting him and are expecting good things, just like those five virgins were expecting good things. Yes, sir. Oh, so are you saying this is a workspace theology? Uh, <laughs> well, actually, yeah. <laughs> You need to walk it. You need to walk it. And so there's there's where we tie into the whole the whole concept of the Ezra piece here. They didn't get to know him through the work, the oil of doing stuff. And they had to go out and do that for themselves. Um, and so really that to me that's where they become they were directed to keep his commandments. They failed to do so and you can't just do that instantly. They needed to go do the thing and learn it through fire. So I'll disagree with you a little bit on that. Um, the thief hanging on the stake next to Yeshua, and Yeshua says, I'll see you this day in heaven. That guy just came to the way while he's nailed to this stake. It is a heart thing. but the And so I'm not totally disagreeing. That's a little bit. But your heart has to be followed by works. It, it, what's faith without works? It's dead. It is not faith. You can't say I have faith. I tell people, you know, I, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God and he came and he died for the sins of all mankind. That's awesome. So does Satan believe that. Matter of fact, Satan knows about it better than you do. Uh, so th this is not good enough. So I, yes, but also the works have to come unless they can't. I, I love saying this because I'm not a Jew. I'm not Jewish either. Um, when people get overly Jewish, I'm like, you know, we could see Hitler when we get to heaven because we don't know what happened to Hitler in his last hours. He could have, I don't think he did, but he could have turned his life over to Yeshua and said, I want to do it. I, the light has hit me and, and you don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah, but if you just confess with your mouth today and then go eat a ham sandwich right. and... Well, there's a lot of works involved. There's just confessing with his ability. I see what you're saying. Because that's all he could do. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> yes, sir. That was rare then, though. It's shameful. Yeah. Which is so here's the thing on being a man not being under the power of anything other than Yeshua. When you feel uh, like someone or something is pressuring you that you have to do something. Whatever that thing is, you need to do a quick evaluation of that. Is this a thing that's glorifying Yah or not? And if it's not, you need to resist it. And I'll tell you, I have an automatic reaction when somebody tells me you have to do something or you can't do something. Whether I say it out loud, I definitely think it, or what? You, know, you can't do that. Oh, yeah, what if I do? Because I'm thinking that right now. I'm thinking, what are you, what are you implying the consequences are going to be to me of this thing? And how am I going to mitigate or deal with those consequences? And that's the thing. It's like, don't feel compelled. Don't feel under the power of anything else. I'm a jerk. I mean, here, I'll give you Joe 101. You want to get me to not do something? Tell me I have to do it. It's like, all right, we got to make sure Joe doesn't do this thing. Okay, go tell him he has to do it. <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> yes, sir. Any book for young men? Wow. Dude, I have a library of like, I have 32 feet. <laughs> Yeah, my book. No, I, I can't, can't do. It. I got 32 feet, eight foot high of bookshelves. So three. I don't know. I have to think about that one. Like narrowing it down is crazy for me. And also, here, here's the truthful thing. My books. I know, but the books that I read are almost all prepper, special ops, intel, homesteading. Like that. Not much of which have to do with. Being a man, um, you know, I don't know. Biographies, biographies of great men, you know, but most, I've learned this, that you all probably have to, uh, the further I get in this walk, the more I look at people, I just see how lost and broken they are. So like Teddy Roosevelt, like I quote his man in the arena a lot, right? It's a great speech. But you look at him, it's like, yeah, I'm just... No, nah, I'm not going to say you should read all about Teddy Roosevelt and learn about him. Yeah, I don't know. It's, somebody had a hand up over here. I just say, well, other than your book and the Bible, obviously. My wife's book, Homestead Hints by <laughs> S.K. Fox. <laughs> Basically, is a lot of what the Bible is about. Is a lot of it. I'm not saying you're saying it's the Bible. 
Sure, sure. I, no, you don't have to qualify it. Yeah, I haven't read it. I know who Jocko is. Because he's a man. Who else has got something? Come on. Homesteading, come out of her, my people. You got me here. You, you got me standing here. That's why I don't want to. Yes, sir. Another thing uh, that you could do is get more like-minded people together with you so that it's not you taking on that massive burden. You all could chip in. You can all buy fencing together. You all can uh, purchase a property together. So it's not just you putting out. You all can do that. So then it feels like nothing is even leaving your pocket. You all can till the land. You all can raise the animals. And that one will take care of uh, you not doing things. Uh, doing things with debt. You will learn skills. You will build community. And be happy. We have a lot of shofarians that uh, share land to one way or another, but we have different families sets on a piece of land, again, whether that's permanent or temporary until they get their own place or whatever, and that seems to work pretty good. There's downfalls to it, there's pluses to it, and I don't think anybody's totally cracked the code on it, um, but you have to decide you want to do it. Yes, sir, you are next. Yeah. Oh, good point. To acquire all the things you're supposed to have right now. Doing that, you will fail. You won't learn all the skills you need to keep every piece of the system alive. So doing what you can at the speed that you're able to learn it with the money that you have to make you way more successful than acquiring everything instantly and letting it all go to rot. Do the best you can with what you got where you're at. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got a different problem. I know your problem. I know my problem. He's been listening to me for years. He told me to go to 119 ministry. I go to these teach people who are not teaching what you're, I want to hear. I have land. I have developed it. It's permaculture design. It is vacant. It is hard to get like-minded People sometimes to come to the booth. You're in Nebraska. Nebraska. He's like, you're in Nebraska now? Yeah. I'm only two hours away. We'll work something out. Can you remind me where you get the plow every year? There's a good book out there that you might want to read. It's called Creating a Life Together by Diane Leaf Christian. It's a bunch of hippie mumbo jumbo in it. You have to be able to take the meat and spit out the bones. But there's a lot of good stuff about creating community um, in it. And I, I firmly believe the way we're intended to live is in community. Um, whether that's in community with privately held plots of land or whatever, uh, I haven't quite zeroed that out yet. But we're, we're intended to live together. And if you look at it, it's a biblical model. We're supposed to withdraw from, from the world and be together. And so whatever that looks like, it's nice when my neighbor, my neighbor, my neighbor, my neighbor are all keeping Torah. Um, I know their certain baseline, what they will and will not do. Whether they actually worship with me on Shabbat or not, I don't really care. I tell people that all the time. There's just as many denominations in this Torah, Hebrew roots, whatever you want to call it thing. And the Shofarians are definitely at one end of that spectrum. We're, we're not everybody's flavor, but I would rather have a Messianic Jewish people living there than first Southern Baptist church people when push comes to shove. Because the thing is, as this world starts to devolve, and I believe it's doing that quite readily right now, um, there's only going to be two kinds of people on this world. 
It's going to be Yah's people and everybody else. And to the extent that you have anybody else in your circles, you're in danger um, of all kinds of different things. And so we're supposed to withdraw and prepare. Um, so somebody. Yes, sir. Diane Leaf Christian. It's called Creating a Life Together. You can look it up on Amazon or Google. Creating a Life Together. And it has some subtitle like Creating Eco Villages and whatever. But there's a lot of good stuff on contracts. There's a lot of good stuff on how do you get the land, who owns the land, um, how does that work out, how do you build structures, uh, what order do you do things in. It, it's, it's a really good book. I've read it about three times. There, that's one of the books. <laughs> yes, sir. They are. And, you know, it's something that just, I, I thought one of you was going somewhere else with it. Um, there's a lot of people coming to Torah now because I believe we're, we're, we're getting that funnel effect going on now. And the quickening, the, we call it the sifting and the shofarians. We've, we're losing people. We're gaining people. There's people we thought were serious that are fading away. And it's like, okay, that's fine. We, we'd rather find out about it now than later. But I think for those of you with an evangelistic bent, and I actually don't have one. I think it's because I'm an introvert. Um, people are ripe for the word, the word of truth, you know, the word of Yah that, that he wants it done. And if you can find people who are interested in that, because when do people turn to the Father? When they're under duress, right? When everything's good and life's great. And it, God, I got this, man. I'm the one that got this promotion. I'm the one that bought this car. I'm the, and then when everything's falling apart, you're like, oh, God, help me, help me, help me. They're, as the world starts evolving, people are open more to the truth. And um, you might be able to share it with people. Like it was just, it was enough. <laughs> it was just enough, and she like walked off. And I, I, I love this. There's this little tiny glimpse where he says, "So uh, you might have asked questions later somewhere else." Too. So that that comment, that that concept, two things. I was at the, my church was trying to fire me, uh, Round Prairie Community Church, because I had decided we needed to follow Torah, and uh, they called a meeting on a Friday night, and I told my wife I'm only going to answer with scripture, and I anticipated. Their questions, and I had three legal pads of Bible verses written out, and they would say, what about this? And I would go, and all I knew at that point, I didn't know a lot of Torah. I just knew we were supposed to follow it. I was convinced. The Holy Spirit downloaded on me. And the guy that's on the cover of my book was standing over here against this wall, and he goes, because it was standing room only that night, and he goes, what about Zeet Zeet? You going to have us all wearing them next? And I said, I don't know, what's zeet zeet? He goes, it's them strings, the messianics, where are the britches? Numbers 15. I said, I don't know. I went home that night because I wrote it down. I looked up Numbers 15 and I made zeet zeet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a true story. And then the other one where you said you gave her just enough. Um, long story short, my wife and I, again, I was Christian. Uh, it was about two years before I came to Torah. 
We're getting a tour of a goat facility because we're thinking about raising goats and the woman takes my wife and walks that way and the man takes me and walks this way. As it turns out, they're Seventh-day Adventists who keep Shabbat. And he said, you know, Joe, the real Shabbat is, and I said, yeah, I know, it's Friday night, Sunday, Saturday night, sundown, but Jesus is my Sabbath. He's like, okay, and he shut up. Well, we, when the two couples joined up in the farm, we came from different directions. The woman said, I was just telling your wife about Shabbat. And I told her the same thing. I said, yeah, I know. It's Friday night at sundown until Saturday night at sundown, but Jesus is my Sabbath. And the woman went, oh, you know about Sabbath and you don't keep it? And that's all she said. Oh, that bugged me. That <laughs> bugged me. And that is what led me, that one comment, a year or so later to come to Torah. Uh, I'm like, no, we got to do this. Yes, sir. When you wrote up your list, did you go where they would come at from a big C perspective to attack Torah, following Torah? Yeah. Do you have that compiled anywhere? I probably have it somewhere, but I don't know where, like off the top of my head. Because you got to understand, then I was living in a 2,500 square foot house, and then I moved into a 7 by 17 foot trailer. Um, so everything didn't come with me. Yes, sir. Oh well, I didn't know. I didn't know how like all the supposed contradictions were that Christians throw at you. I didn't know those, and now I can hit them all out of the park like people who've been doing this for a while can. It's like. Psh. Oh, yeah, I tell everybody should read that book. It, actually, somebody needs to rewrite that book because it's kind of dry. Um, but I actually had to read that book for a job I had one time, um, amongst others. But, yeah, you got to know how to get along with people. Does it? He was probably doing the same job I was doing when they told him to read it. <laughs> so it, it, he, he, whether he did it intentionally or not, it's very, very much modeled after the Book of Huh. Yes, sir. Um, it's a phenomenal book that turned around history. It's uh, The Power of One More by Edmar Leff. Uh, it just talks about doing, reading one more gospel, doing one more push-up, taking that one extra step on your road with Jesus. But also, it gets really deep into the reverse of it as well, smoking one more cigarette, having one more drink. So it's, it's a nice dichotomy between them. But for the lack of discipline we have in the world now, there's a gem. Huh. The power of one more. Power one more. I need to learn the power of no. <laughs> I told my wife that. It's like, if you guys could see my calendar, it's like so full. And we look at each other sometimes and go, when are we going to get to just sit on our porch and listen to the cicadas, you know? And it's like, well, we agreed to do everything that's on this calendar. We just need to say no. Just put the goggles on. Just put the goggles on. <laughs> yes, sir. Too old. No. <laughs> Along with 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Yeah, that's a good book. Has very, it has influenced a lot of how scripture I try to my life every day, day in, day out. And I'll be honest, I haven't even finished 12 Rules for Life yet because I can only read so much and go, well, I need to change all of this. I have that book for almost two years now. Huh. So back in the day before there was this thing called the internet, which you don't know, um, <laughs> and 
I used to read these like survivalist magazines and stuff, and that's kind of how you kept in touch with, with each other. And there were newsletters and things like that. And occasionally it would come up. And then it came up when the internet became a thing on bulletin boards and stuff. If you were trapped on a deserted island and could only have one book, what book would you have? And all these silly Christian preppers would always write the Bible. And I'm like, the Bible? Why don't you get a book on edible plants or NATO war surgery or something that's going to be useful? And then as my walk continued, it's like, if I could only have one book, it's, it's probably this exact copy because I got all my notes in it. It's the Bible. And we were just talking yesterday in Shabbat about uh, the Apocrypha or the different, however, that Skiba used to call it, blah, 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 uh, you know, the non-canonical whatever books. Uh, they're interesting. Uh, this is my take on it. They're interesting and whatever. But until you get bored reading this, um, you, you know, there's probably more to learn here. Does anybody think they got this all figured out yet? <laughs> I mean, I'm doing a, I want to do two things. And again, I just need to say no so I have time. I want to get a Bible where the words of Yeshua are in red, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? I want to do a study just on that, like only that. I think that would be fascinating. And then I've been hitting this thing lately about, you know, there's metaphysical stuff in here, if you guys are familiar with metaphysical. And there was just something in Joshua that we read yesterday, and I made a note to myself. I want to kind of get into that and figure out what's going on there. And I'm not going to go be some new age, you know, ooh, look at this cool crystal kind of thing, but it's in there, and it's, it's interesting stuff. So there's so much in here, uh, I don't, I do read other books. I have, like I said, I got 32 feet of books, but man, love it. Anything else? I am. We're talking about our porch now. So, you know, I'm starting to confront my age, right? Like my one knee is just ultra marathons and jumping out of airplanes and carrying 90-pound rucksacks. It's, it's bad. And it's, it's like a weakness, right? Wah, woe is me. But I'm starting to think about, okay, I'm getting older, you know? And then I look around at my life and I'm like, I do things the hard way. I'm married to a wonderful woman. The, the average 62-year-old woman would not put up with half the crap my wife puts up with. And I'm thinking, okay, there's going to come a point uh, when we can't sustain this. But then people like Jody show up and give me hot and cold running water in my house. And it's like, huh, we can go another five years with this. <laughs> so, it, you know what's not in here? Retirement. You know what's also not in here? Taking a weekend off and just partying and chilling. It's work six days. Yeah, and... Uh, it doesn't say that you have to bust your you know, butt from sun up till sundown until you die, but they kind of, you're supposed to stay at it. And so, again, going back to community, um, I think there's a place for everybody in a community. And, you know, that old guy, you know, which I'm not, but that old guy who's like walking like this and, and you know, whatever, he can go literally pick up sticks for kindling. Right. And he can deliver kindling to people. And, you know, the, the old lady can watch the kids while the moms are in the garden. I mean, but that's still work. Right. To do. Um, I don't think we get the rest until the end with Yeshua. Yes, sir.
Yeah, but I'm still 30. I'm still 30. So <laughs> when I'm out there and it's an hour and a half into this job and I'm like, God, I could really go have a sit down. I'm like, dude, you're going to work. But I go have a sit down now too. I'm, I'm trying to listen too. <laughs> Yeah, when we're with him, when we're with him. I'm telling you, you cannot appreciate Shabbat until you're homesteading. There, there is no, I mean, I had a hard job and I, you know, I worked nine to whatever, 6.30 to 2.30 and did all these extra things and then kept Shabbat. It's like, wow, this is kind of nice after I got used to it. Oh, once you're homesteading, it's like, I love Shabbat. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Well, you look great. And when it's there, and you just get tired. It's hard to, to motivate the young guys to say, hey, I've got this place I've worked really hard for, and uh, I just don't get the right people. I had a guy offer me 100 acres and a house in Argentina on the Pampas. I had to look it up. It's like their prairie down there. And he said, I just want you to live in it. Um, I'd like somebody there, and I actually considered moving there. And, you know, he just wanted to have somebody in the house, so the squatters didn't end up taking it over or something. And it was just, it just wasn't in the cards for me to do that at the time. Um, I'll I, I tell you the same thing I told you before is you got to get the word out the best you can, what you're doing here, and, and you've tried to do it online, uh, and you got to pray about it. And it's maybe you're building a place of refuge for people who are moving, you know, we talk amongst the Shofarians, very few of us think we're going to be here through the end. We think we're going to end up moving somewhere else. So, you don't know. But I'll have a stopping off place if you <laughs> no. stop off and rest. I learned this in the country. <laughs> yes, sir. Say again. Who going? The world? I think America's going to break up and balkanize. Um, I think World War III is coming soon. Um, and I think America is going to be destroyed as a nation. And that is going to give rise to the ability of the Antichrist to take over. I don't think America getting destroyed is tribulation. I think America not being a player is going to create the weakness and the void that's going to allow a power in the Antichrist to come. That's what I think. I don't think it's getting better in the short term. So you should have everything you think you need now. And you should have friends and you should have community and you should be fit and everything I talked about today. That's what I think. Yes, sir. I don't remember mentioning yellow rain at all. I know what yellow rain is, and I, I don't remember what I would have said. What did I say? Okay, I know where you're going. I didn't say that recently. You might have watched it recently. Um, I just have a check in my spirit, I guess, is the, the term that, that's useful. For the redoubt, and the redoubt is like eastern Washington and Oregon, Idaho, big chunk of Wyoming, western Montana, right there. Um, a lot of believing in Yeshua preppers are moving there and, and setting up there. Um, and it was popularized by Rawls, Wesley Rawls. Um, I just have a feeling that that place could get like yellow rain or nuked or, or something um, because they're so obvious that they're there and they're, they're really, you know, it's the patriots and they're anti-government and dun 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 dun, dun and it's just, you don't want to be the first couple nails sticking up and they're already sticking up and, you know, who can stand against the beast? Um, I don't think that's good. Whereas I look at the Ozarks, it's pretty low key. You don't see a whole lot of patriot activity in the Ozarks. You see a lot of farmers and hardcore believers, Christians, Torah observant people. Um, 
and there's really not that many resources here. There's not that many resources in the redoubt either um, that people want, but there, you got a lot of people making a lot of noise. And I think when you hold up your gun and tell the, the government, Molan Lave, uh, they'll take you up on that offer. That was kind of somber. Somebody have a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Somebody said it's by bread. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I think that went over most people's head, but not mine. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Kipling. You know what I couldn't find, and I haven't looked online, but I looked at a lot of bookstores, the complete works of Rudyard Kipling, and at, even when it says the complete works, there's like things that aren't in there, like Kim. Kim's a great story. Um, yeah. Okay. Final question. Yes, sir. Oh, well, maybe it's not. You, yeah, it is. So I have several books outlined um, in like little folders on my computer. I am absolutely not writing a book right now. And, and the truth of the matter is, it's a time thing. And you need to spend, I would say, at least an hour and probably two a day, every day, writing to, to get into the flow of the book. And I honestly, um, right now, I don't have that. I don't have that time. I'm trying to homestead and run a Patreon channel and run a community, sort of, and... Well, we appreciate it. Oh, thank you. All right, I appreciate y'all. I will be around chit-chatting with you like you are with everybody else. Um, y'all bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. I need this table.